Andronicus Ducas, Domesticus of the East, circa 904 to 906 CE. In 906, Andronicus Ducas shocked the world when he failed to obey the emperor's direct orders, and within a year's time he found himself taking refuge at the Abbasid court in Baghdad. It is possible that Ducas's flight from the empire was entirely unnecessary and due to a misunderstanding on his part about the emperor's intentions. When Leo VI attempted to recall his wayward general, this communication also led to a misunderstanding, this time on the part of the Abbasid court. To prove that he was not a spy, Ducas was forced to convert to Islam. In this video, I want to explore the larger career of Andronicus Ducas before discussing what I tend to think of as the Ducas Affair. I will explore what we can learn about this period by studying how the Ducas Affair played out. Finally, I speculate on how Andronicus's end influenced the actions of his son Constantine, whose decisions would cause the Ducas family to lose much of its standing to the Focades and the Lacapanoi. There are some scholars who believe that the Ducai, that is the Greek plural of Ducas, were actually not necessarily all related, but rather the descendants of various people who in the past had been awarded the Latin title of Dukes, which translated into Greek as Dukes with an O-U. And then that there are therefore multiple families called the Ducai who are not actually related. It's possible that those scholars are right, but I don't really want to delve into etymology as all of my knowledge of Greek is ancient and not medieval. So I leave all of those debates to other people, but I thought you should just be aware of the possibility. At any rate, when we're talking about this particular line of Ducai, we can speak more knowledgeably. The first recorded Ducas of this particular branch was active around 855 or so, and most likely this individual was either the father or grandfather of the Andronicus Ducas we're talking about today. By Andronicus's time in the early 10th century, the Ducas family had become one of the most prominent families among the entire military aristocracy. We know that Andronicus had a lot of ties with many influential people throughout the empire, including, as we'll see, the patriarch Nicholas Mysticus. It's possible that Andronicus himself did a great deal to secure his family's reputation before the events that we'll cover from 904 forward. By 904, Andronicus was already at least middle-aged and possibly even pushing old age. We know that his son Constantine was already an adult who could take on major assignments. Constantine was tasked with hunting down the court eunuch Simonas and forcing him to return the court. So clearly he was someone who was already active in his own right, and as early as about 908 or 909, Constantine would receive a major appointment in his own right from the Emperor Leo VI. So this means that the family as a whole was seen as very important by the imperial court, and that Andronicus must have been getting relatively old by the time that we really start to hear about him in the sources. You may be wondering why am I showing a graphic of modern American political parties in a presentation about Byzantium? The answer is simple. I want to remind people that when it comes to court politics, while sometimes the term party or faction is employed, it's important to remember that those parties and factions are very, very different from modern political parties. There aren't necessarily that many ideas at play in an ancient or medieval faction, especially if it's a court faction. It revolves very much around family alliances, geography, basic economic interest, and also it revolves around individual personalities. Occasionally, it will also revolve around ideas in the case of theology, but those alliances tend to be fairly impermanent and they can shift fairly rapidly depending on who's married to who at any particular time. At any rate, when we look at the story of Andronicus Ducas, we have to remember that his power rested in the strength of the relationships that he had with other grandees of the empire. On the, in the allies column for Andronicus Ducas, there is the patriarch Nicholas Mysticus. The two of them seem to have been friends. 
and we can assume that Andronicus was perhaps not a huge fan of Leo's fourth marriage for that reason. Gregorius Iberitzes was a fellow general and an in-law, so they seem to have been close, and we have some evidence that we'll get to that the two men had a decent amount of understanding and respect between them. And another general that we know that he operated with in 904, Eustathius Argyros. We don't know if they were necessarily friends, but clearly they could operate together and they won a victory together. So they're probably more friendly than not, I would imagine. Also, the Argyroi are another one of the more important of the aristocratic families of the empire. We know of only one definite enemy that Andronicus Ducas had, and that was the eunuch Samanas. He had been arrested and returned to Constantinople by Constantine Ducas, the son of Andronicus, in 904, and our sources claim that Samanas had a grudge against all of the Ducai due to that particular action. We'll talk about the plausibility of that when we get there. Suffice it to say that because of the trouble that Ducas finds himself in after he refuses a direct order in 906, he is looking very carefully at the composition of the court and who surrounds the emperor, because he knows he will need the emperor's mercy. And in early 907, when his life and career are on the line, Andronicus Ducas looks at a Constantinople where Samanus is in favor and Nicholas Mysticus was not. So if you're wondering why Andronicus chose to flee to the east, this might provide a clue. By 904, the Byzantine world had become rather accustomed to being on the winning side of the various wars that they had engaged in. Their troops were increasing in quality vis-a-vis -vis their opponents, and their borders were steadily expanding in both the Balkans and in the east. One area where their efforts had been slackened, however, was in the maintenance of an effective battle fleet. And in 904, this cost the Byzantines dearly. That summer, Leo of Tripoli, the great Muslim commander, sailed up to Constantinople and threatened the city briefly. The Byzantine fleet was not in a great position to challenge him, and when he sailed away, they breathed a sigh of relief, thinking that the threat had been lifted for the year and that all would be well. Little did they know that Leo of Tripoli instead had made a beeline for Thessalonica rather than sailing home. When he arrived at Thessalonica, the empire's second city and second largest port, he found that the defenses were in disrepair as no one had expected an assault on this city. He was able to capture Thessalonica within about three days, which is well before Constantinople was aware of what was happening and able to dispatch reinforcements. The fall of Thessalonica was one of the great tragedies of the era for the Byzantines and it was economically relatively damaging. Leo of Tripoli took 30,000 prisoners who needed to be ransomed, and he also took a great deal of plunder. Leo VI, when he learned of this great catastrophe, vowed vengeance, and in addition to rebuilding Thessalonica, he embarked on a naval buildup, and at this time also he most likely ordered his eastern armies to advance on Cilicia, Cilicia was the region which held the city of Tarsus, which is where Leo of Tripoli was officially assigned as a lieutenant governor or something along those lines. And it was also one of the major ports that Leo operated out of. So Leo VI, his first move was to order an invasion of the home territory of the admiral who had just scoured his second largest city almost off the map. And here is where Andronicus Ducas enters into the equation. A few months after the July 404 sack of Thessalonica, Ducas led an invasion of Cilicia, accompanied by Eustathius Argyros, one of the more interesting generals of this period. As I mentioned before, the most likely cause of this campaign was retaliation over Thessalonica, rather than it having been a planned campaign. Had this been a planned annual campaign, it would have launched a good deal earlier. As it is, it looks like the Byzantines only entered Cilicia around September or October, which is unusually late in this year. One advantage that the Byzantines had, despite having to 
hastily put together their army and invade enemy territory is that the enemy in Cilicia was not politically unified. They did have some understanding between them as various Muslim emirates that they would fight against any Byzantine invasion, but they weren't necessarily centrally coordinated. The two greatest powers of Cilicia were Mopsuestia and Tarsus, and they worked together to field an army to face off against Ducas. Not far from the city that the Byzantines called Germanicia and which the Muslims called Marish, the two forces squared off and Ducas was able to emerge victorious. Soon after winning this victory at Germanicia, Leo VI appointed Ducas as the new Domesticus of the East. It is unclear who held the post before him, but this victory definitely advanced the interest of Ducas and his family. The Domesticus of the East is effectively the commander-in-chief of all the Eastern armies, and this meant that Ducas would have new opportunities to really distinguish himself in the future, especially since it was clear that his invasion of Cilicia had not quite gained the full revenge for Thessalonica, and that he would most likely find himself in battle yet again, not too far forward into the future. For almost two years, the emperor planned his counterstrike in order to avenge the fall of Thessalonica. This amounted to a large-scale expedition to Tarsus with a rebuilt fleet. In late 906, the imperial fleet arrived off the coast of Adelaea under the command of Hymerius. Hymerius got his position primarily due to being the uncle of the empress Zoe Carbonopsina, the fourth wife of Leo VI, and most of his experience was actually in civil government up to that point. He had commanded the fleet right after Leo had sacked his predecessor during the crisis where Leo of Tripoli's fleet was in the harbor at Constantinople, but Hymerius up to this point had not been seriously challenged, and so he was something of a risk as a commander of a force of this size. The plan called for Hymerius to meet with Andronicus Ducas off the coast pick up some of his forces, possibly including Ducas, but it's not clear, and then sail on to Tarsus in order to level the city and exact revenge for Thessalonica. It's clear from the way that things are phrased that the intention is for either Hymerius to take some of Andronicus's army and leave him behind, or else to take him along with Hymerius retaining the supreme command. All plans run into difficulties, and the difficulty with this plan is that Andronicus Ducas, for whatever reason, decided not to cooperate with Hymerius at all. He refused to meet with him and also sent him no troops. We'll talk about the possible reasons that our sources hint at in a little bit, but for now it's important just to note that Andronicus Ducas had disobeyed a direct order and had largely worked to undermine a major imperial initiative. This act was in direct defiance of imperial orders at best, so you could say that it was in subordination deserving of a dismissal from office and possible jail time. And at worst, this was treason pure and simple. Typically, when a powerful general refuses to obey orders or to send troops away from his own command, it is a sign that he wants those troops around so he can make a bid for the throne in his own name. So it would not be unreasonable for Leo and people in Constantinople to hear about Andronicus's actions and just assume that this was an open rebellion. This was a classic sign of a rebellion. We'll get into Andronicus Ducas's motives later, however. Hymerius managed to win a fleet action on his own. He left without Ducas's forces. And then, shockingly, after defeating the fleet, he was then able to land at Tarsus, and just with the troops he had with him, he was able to sack the city and win a pretty dramatic victory, which kind of erased the stain of Thessalonica. This was great for the Byzantine Empire, and of course for Leo VI. However, for Andronicus Ducas, this made him look even worse. Had Hymerius failed, he could have then pretended that his refusal to cooperate had to do with the unfeasibility of the plan or something along those lines, but as it stands, he just looks either insubordinate or treasonous, or both. Now that we understand 
what Andronicus did and his initial refusal to obey orders, let us try to establish why he did what he did. John Julius Norwick suggested that as one of the leading lights of the Anatolian military aristocracy, Ducas refused to obey orders from Hymerius because he felt that Hymerius was not his social equal. The problem with this argument is that I don't think Norwick understands how high-ranking Hymerius actually was. While Hymerius was not part of the military aristocracy, he wasn't just some guy who got elevated to office because his niece married the emperor. So I think we can dismiss this particular claim, although as a secondary reason, this might be a driver of the prejudice between Ducas and against Himerius. Um, Ducas was probably not a big fan of serving under someone who was less experienced, as I said earlier, and he probably did feel that he was superior as a military aristocrat as opposed to a bureaucrat. But that is only a prejudice and not really a reason. The sources speculate that Simonus, a court eunuch who came from the east originally, sent false reports to Andronicus Ducas that Hymerius was going to arrest him in order to make Ducas paranoid and then make him make bad decisions which would ruin his career. This would gain revenge for what Constantine Ducas had done to Simonus by preventing him from returning to his homeland in 904. The problem with this, of course, aside from how many steps are involved and how elaborate it is, is that it plays very heavily to two very well-known tropes in Byzantine literature. One is that eunuchs are always evil and conniving no matter what, with the exception of Basil Lycopinus, who we'll talk about at a later date. But for the most part, the sources are almost universally negative when it comes to any eunuch doing anything. And eunuchs are always scheming. And the reason is that the people who wrote almost all of the history from this period were people who were related to the military aristocracy in some way. And they were competing for influence with the bureaucrats in the city, including the palace eunuchs. So therefore, the palace eunuchs are always bad. Another thing to note is that... Simonas was not only a, a eunuch, but also a eunuch from the East. And there were certain ethnic stereotypes about people from the East. So keep all of that in mind. I take the story with a grain of salt. If I had to propose my own idea here, and that's what I'm going to do, I think that a lot of it is simple personal rivalry. Andronicus Ducas was a domesticus who had just recently won a significant victory in Cilicia. A lot of the forces involved in that victory had been from Tarsus, and Ducas felt that it was his right as a new domesticus who had been successful to lead this expedition rather than the less experienced Himerius. Therefore, he probably dragged his heels and felt that the emperor had, in some small way, slighted his honor. So... That would be what I would adduce as the major cause here, but we don't really know. Of course, it's also possible that Ducas was planning to mount a full-on rebellion and try to seize the throne, but this would have been a very bad time to do something like that since the emperor was in the middle of a military buildup and Leo was very popular broadly with the military, even if he had some problems with the church. So it would not have gone terribly well. Nonetheless, sometimes people do dumb things, so we cannot completely rule out the possibility that Ducas was legitimately trying to revolt, and that his revolt just happened to faceplant. For most inhabitants of the Empire, the news of the great victory at Tarsus was a cause for celebration. However, for Andronicus Ducas, this news caused him to fall into a white-hot panic. He immediately abandoned his post as Domesticus and fled to the fortress of Kabbalah near Iconium. This seems to have been an area where the Dukai were rather strong, where they had a number of estates, and it was also not far from the frontier. Dukas was replaced by, as Domesticus by one of his in-laws, Gregorius Iberitzes, and it appears that the two of them had a decent rapport as Iberitzes was largely able to talk Andronicus down 
and had him on the verge of surrendering peacefully. Just before the surrender could be completed, however, news arrived that Leo VI had decided to remove Patriarch Nicholas Mysticus and replace him with someone more amenable to his fourth marriage. From Dukas' perspective, this meant that his cause was bound to fail when he went back to court. Dukas was a long-standing friend of the Patriarch and saw him as a key ally in his defense, so without Nicholas Mysticus around, he refused to surrender. It's also, of course, possible that he was just a very hardcore believer in the idea of limiting marriage to two or three per person, and that it was theology which drove him to do this. I find that unlikely, but it is actually possible. My question then becomes, did Dukas understand why Leo decided to remove the Patriarch? Clearly, the reason had nothing to do with Andronicus Dukas and everything to do with Leo's need to marry Zoe Carbonopsina and make Constantine VII officially legitimate so that way he could inherit the empire. It's possible, given the recent dramatic actions that he had taken, that Andronicus Dukas felt that the whole world's attention was on him and that any major decisions were about him in some way. So perhaps that is why he decided that he couldn't surrender even if he did trust Iberitzes and he therefore submitted to a siege. He also seems to have sent to the east to ask for aid. That in itself is also fairly suspect and it makes it more possible that he actually had been planning something along the lines of a rebellion. But again, it is far from certain. It is unlikely that the fortress at Kabbalah had been provisioned well enough to withstand a long siege. So fortunately for the Dukai, Arab forces arrived and broke through the siege lines, enabling the Dukai, father and son, to escape to Baghdad. They went by a fairly circuitous route before they ended up getting there. But by the end of 907, they were at the Abbasid court. It would appear that the Abbasids were primarily interested in Andronicus and did not pay nearly as much attention to his son Constantine, despite the fact that he was already old enough to be important in his own right. While he was officially welcomed and given a home to live in and other amenities, there were some suspicions at court about the arrival of such a senior official. At this time, the Abbasid Caliphate was in the hands of an 11 or 12 year old boy and therefore everything was in the hands of his counselors. They seem to have been divided in their opinions about what Andronicus was up to and also what they should do about it. Anytime a senior aristocrat who could potentially run, uh, put himself up as emperor arrived, this was always an opportunity to sow dissent among your enemies and to cause a civil war across the frontier. But they don't seem to have really trusted Andronicus. The fact that they weren't in agreement that he should be trusted is, in my mind, one pretty strong piece of evidence that Andronicus Dukas had not intended to revolt and that this had been a huge misunderstanding with the emperor. It would appear that both Dukas and Leo VI regretted how things had turned out, and Leo actually wrote a poem of lamentation about losing his general in this way. It is possible, as at least one author has opined, that much of the emperor's lament was over the possibility of having a rogue general in the east who might come back at the head of a foreign army. But if that was his fear, fortunately for the Byzantines, this would not end up happening. In 908 or 909, Leo sent an embassy to Baghdad to conduct other business but included a candle with a letter inside of it, which explained to Dukas that if he returned home, he would be restored to his former station and all would be forgiven. This undoubtedly was exactly what Dukas had been hoping to hear. He was much happier on his home estates commanding men in the field than he was as a glorified house guest at Baghdad, especially a glorified house guest who was under suspicion from about half of the Abbasid court. Unfortunately for Dukas, he most likely learned of the emperor's generous offer 
not from the letter in the candle, but rather from an Abbasid official waving it in his face with the wax still coming off of it. The Abbasid authorities had carefully searched all of the packages bound for Andronicus Ducas because, as I mentioned, a large part of the court still suspected that he was a spy. And finding this letter was all the proof that many people at court needed that the factions saying that he was a spy had been correct all along. Why would the Byzantines dispatch such a high-ranking spy, you might ask? I'm not sure. If I had to hazard a guess, and this is a pretty wild guess, I imagine that there was a lot of insecurity at Baghdad because the Abbasids knew that the army that they themselves could personally muster was rather weak, and they knew that Byzantine arms had been advancing in recent years. While there was not a direct connection or a safe route for an army to march from, say, Iconium to Baghdad, a daring commander who was willing to risk everything and risk a 90% chance of losing his entire army could still potentially attempt something of that nature. So perhaps Dukas was on a scouting mission, or perhaps he was trying to play to some of the court factions to weaken the Abbasids in some way, or to get someone appointed to one of the little emirates on the frontier in a way that would favor Byzantium. Paranoia has its own logic, and undoubtedly, when you're at the Abbasid court and you're somewhat insulated from the frontier, yet you're aware of your weakness, that kind of paranoia is pretty easy to foster. At any rate, Dukas was taken captive and he was given a choice. He could either admit that he was a spy and be put to death, or he could prove his innocence and respect for the Abbasid Caliph by converting to Islam. Dukas decided to save his life by converting to Islam, and then he lived under house arrest for the rest of his days. For most of his stay in Baghdad thus far, Andronicus had enjoyed the company of at least one other person, his son Constantine. However, after he got burned by the emperor's candle, Andronicus now found himself alone. Either immediately before, during, or right after Andronicus was forced to convert to Islam and placed under close watch, Constantine had decided to escape from Baghdad and return to the empire. He effectively took up the offer that Leo had put forward to his father, and he was given his father's old position. In time, as we'll see when we get to Constantine Dukas in a future video, this would prove to be a bad mistake on Leo VI's part, but that is a different story for a different time. As for old man Andronicus Dukas, he was now a stranger in a strange land and bound to live that way for the remainder of his days. He was in Baghdad, he had limited freedom of movement, and his health seems to have been in a poor state. He died soon after the candle incident, around the year 910. It is possible that Andronicus Dukas was a traitor and one who lacked the competence to be remotely effective. However, I find it far more likely that the whole incident from his refusal to go with Himerius down to the failure to return from Baghdad came down to a series of continual and compounding miscommunications between Dukas and the Emperor. I don't, as I said earlier, accept the verdict of the sources that all of this was the plot of the eunuch Samanus, and I think rather that is simply a case of the sources always finding a way to blame a eunuch, and he happened to be the one who might have some indirect motive in this event. As I mentioned earlier, I think that it was a combination of his own pride, i.e. not wanting to serve under Hymerius, and this lack of communication with Leo. So what would have been the tension between Dukas and the Emperor that would have led them both to be so awkward during this time? My suspicion is that because Dukas was an ally of Nicholas Mysticus, that he may have spoken out publicly against the Emperor's marital practices,
and perhaps he thought that the emperor was taking it personally and had a grudge against him. It would appear that while Leo most likely was not happy about Ducas' stance on the marriage, assuming that Ducas took a public stance, he did not hold it against him personally because he knew that he was really pushing boundaries, but also knew that his actions were justified because it would keep his dynasty going. So it was a fraught situation and it was an awkward one socially from the perspective of both Ducas and the Emperor. Neither of them handled it all that well, although on balance, Ducas did not really acquit himself very honorably in this whole affair. He seemed a bit panicky from the outset, and he literally did request aid from the Arabs and got it, and then got foreign um, status as well at Baghdad. Another interesting aspect of Ducas's peril is that his experience in Baghdad shows what can possibly go wrong when a high-ranking official seeks refuge with a foreign power. For the most part, it is just more or less a vacation that is a bit boring, and that power tries to find ways to return you to your people in a way that will cause harm to your people, but help you. But mostly help themselves, obviously. And Ducas' experience did not go that way, possibly because, in part, he did not want it to go that way. He probably was loyal to the Empire, he just had no idea how to communicate with the Emperor or work with him at this time. I think that the narrative that Andronicus Ducas was a traitor really got reinforced in the historiographical tradition because of the actions of his son Constantine around 913. Most likely, these two events, the Ducas affair of 906 to 910 and Constantine Ducas's attempted revolt in 913, were most likely unrelated. However, um, I imagine that because they were father and son and these events were chronologically close together, that in the minds of the aristocrats who wrote the sources, these two things must therefore be connected or else perhaps just some genetic defect of the Dukai that they are a bit prone to the old treason. Whatever the truth may be, Andronicus Dukas and his experiences are interesting, and I hope that you've enjoyed hearing about them as much as I enjoyed reading about them and putting all of this together. I'm Thersites the Historian, and I will see you next time. I'm not sure who we're talking about next on Romans of Renown, but hopefully it will be someone interesting.